so I certainly don't want to be, if, if this thing should go long, we should have really good discussions about what we need to do about the food. And um, I'm Nancy Brown. I'm with the city of Winston-Salem. And i tell you a little bit about how this, this whole session came about. Um, I was chatting with the conference committee. And I said I thought this would be a good topic. And kind of left it. And then like the next month or so when we had a conference call and an email went out about, you know, here's the agenda. My name was next to it. Didn't mean I wanted to present it. <laughs> I was kind of hoping somebody else would and I could learn from it, but anyway, no biggie. Um, so I have done um, some, some research in some of these areas and then uh, we also have a succession planning program um, that we're doing in the city that has been quite successful, so and I can speak some about that as well. So hopefully this will be enjoyable and you'll be able to have a few takeaways that might can help you uh, when you go back to your departments. Hiring and recruiting. Um, if you're going to be hiring for any kind of position, when you think about the cost to onboard an employee and you think about the time that you spend interviewing and working to, to get this person here, and the fact that they're going to be, once you hire them, you're going to have them for a period of time, whether they work out or whether they don't work out. Um, it's worth it to spend a little bit of time thinking about it. So, you know, have a strategy. So, what do I mean by that? Um, think about what the ideal candidate looks like for this position. Because if you're hiring for somebody that maybe has been in that position for eight or ten years and either they've left your organization or maybe they've been promoted to something else, you can't really look back at the job description that you used when you hired them because things change so fast. So, you know, what are you looking for? What's your ideal candidate? So start thinking about, you know, what you want to see, what kind of skills you're going to want, um, and what kind of experience. Because that's going to help you then to this next step. Um, think about the demographics. You know, if you want somebody that's been in IT for a long time, you're probably looking maybe at the Gen X group. If you're looking for somebody to come in and you know work in your network environment and you want somebody that's really gung ho and doesn't care about working nights and weekends because they want kids and things like that, um, and is you know really hot on all this new stuff, then you may be looking at a millennial. Um, but that's important because you reach these folks in your recruitment in different places. And then, of course, there's always the diverse populations. We want our IT departments to be diverse because we serve, um, we live in a diverse world, and we serve diverse populations. And I can tell you firsthand that when you have a diverse group of individuals working with you, you get much better input um, at the group level, and you get much better solutions because people bring so many different perspectives to problem solving. So you want to think about those things. So you can, you know, again, reach the right groups and target your advertisements. So I've got this interviewing as a team sport, and I forget we use this team thing together. Everyone achieves more. You probably all sat in the customer service things where they talk about that. But it really is kind of appropriate when you're talking about interviewing. Um, you really, again, need those different perspectives, and. You know, you're going to want to start with the hiring manager, obviously, because that person needs to be able to make the decision because this person's working for you. But you want somebody from HR. You want to make sure you don't do anything or say anything that's not quite right um, in the interview. A lot of times if you've got a good candidate, they want to know specifics about benefits. And it's much better, I can tell you, to have that HR person there and defer to them to answer those questions. And usually, you know, your HR folks, they're accustomed to this. And when we invite the HR representative, they already have a sheet, you know, that they're prepared to hand out that they can also answer those questions. They can also talk about the process um, that the prospective employee could expect to see, you know, if an offer is made. Because in our organization, it's HR that actually makes the offer. And so they can speak to those things. And then, you know, you want your stakeholders. Who's going to be working with this person? Um, 
You don't always want your management team sitting in on these things. You want these team members around. Um, are they to try and gauge, is this person going to be a good fit in the culture? Um, so it's important for that. But then here's another one that, um, again, I've got some firsthand um, experience with this in trying to keep your panel diverse, um, where I've been inviting individuals from outside the IT department to sit on, in on these interviews. And it's been incredibly value, valuable. I s recently recruited and um, promoted an employee to a supervisory position, and I had two supervisors that were not in IT at all. They're some of our users of IT, but they've been around the organization, and they could bring that <coughs> supervisory role, you know, what's a good supervisor? Because if you're a good supervisor, and that's what you're hiring for, um, it doesn't have to be IT. There's a certain set of skills that every good supervisor has. And so they could speak to those things and help me gauge those where they, maybe they weren't so strong in the IT side, um, but that was okay. They gave me incredibly good feedback. And so I will be looking to do that much, much more in the future, bringing one or two people who are not IT to these interviews. It also helps you gauge you know, it depends on the position you're hiring for, but if you've got somebody that you're gonna is gonna work in the in the data center or whatever, and maybe they're not gonna interact with your outside customers so much, might not be so important that techie rapport. But if you've got somebody that is gonna be working with your customers and they can only speak tech, you're gonna kind of find it out and you're gonna get that sort of feedback from these outside folks. You know, is this somebody I really want to work with? Um, not that you would exclude somebody for that, maybe, but it, le it certainly lets you know how comfortable others in your organization will feel. Um, have a defined interview plan. Um, a standard set of questions for every candidate. First of all, that adds to fairness because everybody's getting an opportunity to respond to the same question. You may get additional questions that come up in the interview based on answers and things that they give you, but everybody gets the same shot at, at presenting themselves. And it also allows you to cover a wide range of topics um, around this particular position. Categorizing, um, so that, you know, maybe you're talking, asking questions about soft skills and you're asking questions about technical skills. Again, in the case of the supervisory one, we were asking some of those things, have you ever worked with budgets? Have you had to put together a budget? Do you know what an RFP is? Can you write an RFP? Uh, what's the difference between a bid and a quote? Bids typically, you know, more formal. The quote is, you know, just getting pricing. But those little nuances, if you have to, you know, bring somebody in and they don't have that experience, then you're like, oh, you haven't really helped me. I've got to train this person. And maybe, it, you know, it goes back to, and I'll get to that on another slide, you know, what's the most important for you? Decide in advance who's going to ask these questions. So you don't want to gang up on this person, but it's, it works nicely to rotate the questions um, with that panel. Uh, we tended to start out letting the non-technical folks ask some of the soft questions, the customer service questions, the, you know, tell us about yourself and your professional experience, you're the icebreaker type things. And then the IT folks ask the technical things towards the end. But by the fifth or sixth interview, um, they were getting fairly comfortable with asking the tech questions. That's kind of neat. Um, which brings me to that fourth point. Make sure that the people on your panel know what you're expecting. You're the hiring manager. This is going to be your employee. So you know, if you're looking for certain things, like if you ask a question, to somebody, can you please tell me the difference between, or describe the difference between business analysis and project management? Because it's really important to know the differences between them, and it's even more important to know which one comes first. Um, you, know, you can start to weed out some things, but I gave my folks a cheat sheet of, you know, hey, here are terms and things that I'm looking for. You know, if they say, any of these kinds of words or talk about these things, then I know they know what they're talking about. Um, ITIL, you talk about, ask us a question about ITIL. Hey, what do you, 
Uh, what do you know about change management? Um, so, you know, again, I would give them a, a few things to look for. And um, then we be saving on the technical stuff. You know, what's an API? How do you use an API? What do you need to um, Decide in advance which skills are most critical for this position. And I'm going to show you a slide in a minute where we did a matrix and we actually used a weighted rating scale um, and ask your interviewees to, to rate these employees. Um, and it was very interesting to see how this stuff came back, where people were strong and where they were weak. And that can even be a teaching tool, particularly internally. You know, if it comes back and you've got some folks that maybe they're really good technically, but they didn't do so well on those softer areas, then that's, and, but this person wants to advance their career and, and move up in the organization, then you know, that's a mechanism that you can sit with them and speak to and, hey, maybe we can get you more involved in the budget process because you didn't do too well on that. Um, so it's, it's a nice way to, again, um, prepare your employees, your good ones, if you're interviewing internally for advancement. And then, of course, meet as a team afterwards while it's still fresh on people's minds. You know, hey, what was your feeling about this candidate? What did you like? What did you not like? And then, you know, how does this candidate um, compare to some of the others that, that you've um, spoken with? Here's a sample of that weighted matrix that I was talking about. So we kind of broke ours down into education, supervision, professionalism, customer service, interpersonal skills, IT and strategic awareness, and remember this was for a supervisor position, and then administrative duties. And then here, and here's how we weighted it. So there was still a lot of meat here on the technology side, and there was a lot of meat in the customer service um, area, because those are things that you know, are really going to be the strongest needs. I can teach you how to do this stuff. You know, if, if you don't know how to do this, I can teach you this if you have some general awareness. But if, if you don't have this buy-in and that whole um, persona where you're projecting and believing in customer service, then that can be a little tricky for me. And of course, if you don't know at least a little bit about the area that you're going to be supervising, that's a problem too. And that's just a simple Excel spreadsheet. So, where do you find these candidates? You've put together this plan and you've said, okay, I want to look at this demographic and I want these kinds of skills and this level of experience. How do I find them? Here's where they're looking. Everybody looks at job boards, some more than others, but all three of these um, groups tend to look at the job boards and professional organization boards. Newspapers. If, if your HR department, like ours, standard job advertisement is going to three newspapers. Well, if I'm trying to reach these guys, they're never going to see it. That's not where they're looking. They don't even take the newspaper. You know, you get the, the newspaper. Most people that, even my age, if you take the newspaper, you're saving it to put out in your garden or something. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, by the time you get home, they, it's just useless, you know? because you've already got the news because you've been alerted a hundred times during the day. Your website is a starting point. They don't go there. Oh, let me see what jobs are available at the city. <laughs> that, that one's not happening. Now they'll go there, but, you know, if, if you have a posting somewhere else or you have an advertisement somewhere else, they'll go there because that's where they have to apply, but they're not looking there to start with. Um, your university and alumni association boards. If you're a baby boomer, you're kind of past those folks. But um, your Gen X's and your Millennials, um, you can sometimes reach those uh, populations going that way. Your Gen X's, of course, it's going to be the alumni boards. Your Millennials, kind of on the edges of those. <coughs> Some of the younger ones, the ones that are more recently um, out of college and they're still looking for those um, jobs other than the part-time job at the mall because that was all they could get when they graduated. They might be checking the career boards at their university to see you know what's out there. And then some of the ones that are on the older edge of the millennial group, they might have been out in the workforce long enough now that they're looking to advance their careers and move on.
And so they might be going to some of your um, alumni boards. <coughs> so, you know, you, you can sort of kind of reach them. That's not the first place they look, though. Social media. This is, this is your biggie right here. This is where these folks are going. This is where they live. Um, if, they, if somehow you can attract them and get them to, to know that you have a job, and give them some information and get them interested in it, and give them a link, then they'll go to your website. And same thing with Google. IT jobs in the city of Wilmington. That's where they're going. They're looking, whether it's you or whether it's the private sector. They're just doing simple searches like that. Um, so, again, if you want it on Google, then you, know, you, you want that traffic and you, and you want to make sure that you're out there. So, social media, what do you need to know about that? Because I think the rest of it is pretty self-explanatory. Social media presence can boost your candidate reach because that's where they are, that's where they live. Over time, you can use social media to build a brand. And I don't mean a brand for the city of Winston-Salem. We've got a Facebook page and it's pretty bland and boring and I don't even subscribe to it. Um, I don't really care. And my daughter, who's 23 years old, wouldn't really care. But how about a Facebook page for your department? You know, the city's IT department. And you put some things out there and you get your employees to kind of share it out. And events that you have, things that you, um, recognitions that you make for your employees. Hey, here's our employee of the quarter. And they, they're our employee of the quarter because they worked on this really cool thing and they, and they got this uh, nice application out to production or they stopped a cyber attack or you know, something or other. Um, here's how, how we work. Maybe just some nice, appropriate shots of the work environment. <laughs> um, maybe you know, get a Twitter account, a Twitter account where you're talking about, you know, tweeting about something good. Hey, we just went in production today with such and such. You know, eventually these things can get some traction, particularly if you, you know, make them snazzy. Um, my suggestion would be that you get someone who is much more active in Twitter than I am. I'm a Twitter consumer, not a tweeter. Um, but, you know, they can help you with, with some catchy titles and stuff. And so, um, and LinkedIn. I got stories to tell you about LinkedIn. And I'll be honest, I did not see the value in LinkedIn. I have a LinkedIn account and I don't update it very often. I don't do much there. My daughter graduated from East Carolina this Good time college. last year. And she had a job when she graduated. And she has two degrees. She has a degree in communications and she has a degree in history. Um, she's not an IT person. But her first job, she had it. And on her LinkedIn profile, Someone approached her, an IT consulting firm approached her with, um, hey, would you like to come, we'd like to talk to you about job opportunities just off of her profile. So she responded to that, and she actually spent the last seven or eight months working for an IT recruiting firm in Raleigh. And she was doing really well at it. And for the first time in her life, she learned how to reset password. Because um, that's just, again, not what she did. But what was ironic to me, she was actually going out because of this role in recruiting and was learning how to configure and program Cisco routers. And she learned what subnets were and all this stuff that I'm like, this is my daughter. Um, and she was able to add that stuff to her LinkedIn profile and she got really excited and was thinking about getting Cisco certification. Um, until very recently when she got another call from her LinkedIn profile from another company um, and she just started her new job two weeks ago with a 35% increase in, in base salary. And it was all off of her LinkedIn profile. She didn't even go looking for that job. She had that out there, but she had, there were recruiters in those firms who were combing LinkedIn and looking for people with skills who reached out to her. Okay? This is the new world. You know, you kind of have to go after them. We know how competitive it is in IT right now to find qualified individuals. So we have to approach it different ways. You have to go where they are. So 
again, social media can, can be a good thing. This is another one that is kind of interesting. And before she left, I said, okay, you got to help me with this presentation. Tell me about IT recruiting. Where do people look? And where does your generation look? So this is from the, from the very words of the people who do this. But they want an opportunity to learn about your agency, what you do, who you are, what's your culture like. And for us older folks, we don't really think about that that much, but it really matters to these younger individuals. And they will look on social media sites to see what people are saying about your organization, good or bad. And I got an example of that one coming up in a minute. So, <clears throat> this is it, review boards. There are review boards out there, and people may be posting on them about your agency, whether you know it or not. I went out and looked after she told me this and said, these are the sites we look at. There's one called Glassdoor. And um, I found the city, and I found what people said about the city, and I found some postings about the IT department. And there was one incredibly negative post from 2014. And if I read that, and I was a prospective um, employee coming in, and I read that about a dictative culture, and employee values don't matter, um, and innovation is squashed, I'm not coming here. Not if I can go somewhere else. So these boards are out there, and we kind of have to be aware of them, because they can be good and help promote your site, but they can also drag you down and keep the good candidates away from you. So there again, it's an area where we have to start looking and paying attention where we hadn't before. You know, social media is more than just a tool. It can, it's a tool that can be used for you or against you. So you need to engage. No, no getting around that. The ones that provide information um, about your culture, good and bad, and let employees actually post about that, <coughs> you can Glassdoor, Indeed, and something called Career League. And then these others, LinkedIn, Vault, Monster, Hallway, Google News, they can find out information about salaries, what kind of jobs you have, um, it, more general demographic type things. Um, <coughs> benefits, you know, people feel like you have good benefits or bad benefits. But the, you, you got to worry about those three at the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, networking. That's another tool you can use. Attend local job fairs, even if you don't have openings, because that puts you with an opportunity to meet with individuals who have skills. Maybe you don't have something for them today, but you might down the road. Um, provide a list of typical skills you seek in candidates. A lot of times they want to know that, particularly if it's somebody that's been laid off or lost their job, and they're looking to beef up their skills because you know they've, they've kind of missed something in and what do I need now to, to come and work in this new environment? So you can actually you know, help them out by saying, well, when we look, here's what we're after generally. Um, share your org chart. Again, help them to understand you know, where you are because your chart's probably not that much different than others. Collect their resumes. Um, hand, if you've got these social media accounts, hand out some cards with those accounts and ask them, hey, Check out our Facebook page or follow us on Twitter um, because we, if we have openings, we'll put those out there and that's a quick way and an easy way for you to know if we have anything that opens up. And of course, the more they share those things, the more your message gets sent out there. And like, same sort of thing here, invite the good ones to, to uh, network with you on social media and, link, and your LinkedIn profiles and things like that. It helps to build that base of resumes and just the contacts because you know they're working with other people too and hey you know I've got a job now but the city just posted something you know you might want to look at it um, so the more you can share the better because remember your HR department I hope there's nobody here from HR but they're gonna post in the newspaper and they're gonna post on your TV station that nobody watches because it's your TV station and you only watch it to see the council meeting minutes and then once council meeting's over, um, they pretty much turn off. Mm -hmm. Think pink. <clears throat> Anybody ever seen the movie Legally Blonde? Mm -hmm. 
there's a scene where she comes up and hands a resume to the professor for an internship, and he says, it's pink. And she says, I know, and it's scented. I think it gives it a little something extra. You gotta think pink. We're competing with, Reese, with other people. In a lot of cases, we're competing with people who can pay more money. So you've gotta attract the good people to your organization. So anything you can do to set yourself apart. Remember, you know, in her example, she's given a resume. A resume and a cover letter has a purpose, and it's to get you an interview. And then once you get that interview, then it's up to the person being interviewed to sell themselves. This is why you want to hire me for this position. But turn that around, the purpose of a job posting is to advertise a job opening not necessarily to recruit that ideal candidate. Um, that's something that's going to happen in the interview where you determine if they're the ideal candidate or not through these other things. So postal quality advertisement, something that's interesting and exciting to the employee you want to recruit. It goes back to that very first thing, have a plan. What would your ideal candidate look like and where would they be? What kinds of things <coughs> are important to them. You know, if you're trying to go after somebody who is going to be interested in work-life balance, then you know, maybe you want to throw something in your advertisement about opportunities to work from home one day a week, or job sharing, or something. You know, anything that you have that would attract that group. Because let me tell you, network administrator, duties, maintaining network, and and server base in a data center. Yeah, that's, that may be what they do, but it's not very exciting, and it, guess what? It looks like everybody else's. So don't copy and paste a stale, poorly written job application or job description just because that's the one in the file from 10 years ago, the last time you hired somebody for this. So on hiring and recruiting, um, any questions or ideas, anything? I would love to hear if you've done anything that's worked really well for you. Um, actually, that has happened in some cases. Typically, that's um, done when it's a very high level, like a department head type thing, we haven't really brought anybody in <coughs> very often from the private sector for um, rank and file kind of jobs. Although I think once or twice we might have, might have had like a vendor if it was something with a really specific skill set and maybe our person was gone. We might have had um, one of our um, Cisco reps, for example, sit there and you know, help us gauge the knowledge that this person has with Cisco equipment. Um, and that's certainly something that, again, brings, brings value. Ready for part two? Mm -hmm. Part two, retention and succession planning. So, okay, you finally got these people hired and you got them in and you got a good one, so you want to keep them. Um, or according to this lovely website down here that's on the presentation, if anybody's interested, I can give it to you. Um, organizations with high rates of employee retention concentrate on creating four distinct cultures. And a lot of the stuff you already know about, and it's like, yeah, I just particularly like this one because they refer to it as culture, because culture is something that you have to create and maintain and see that it's there. You have to live it. Culture is, is a living thing. And I like the way they describe it, so I use them as a reference. So, culture of choice. Employees want choice. We all want choice. Nobody wants to be told what to do. If somebody prefers to use an Apple device to a DOS device or a Windows device, does it really matter if they can get their job done? I mean, if you've got both things in your environment or you can provide both, does it really matter? Do we have to be so cookie cutter that we're going to say, no, you can't use that device? 
And it's even worse, if you look down, technologies enable mobility, more choices. If you're in an IT department and you don't allow your staff to use the cool tools and to be mobile, but they put in a solution for some other department to work in a mobile environment, they're going to get so frustrated with that. I've seen that. You know, how come I can't have this, this productivity? Um, well, because we don't have it in the budget and, and we don't want to buy it and you've already got something or other. These new folks, the, the younger ones, they're not going to tolerate that. They just, they've grown up being able to have what they want. And I want to use this. I don't want to use that. And they're going to say, it doesn't matter. As long as I get my work done, who cares? And really, what difference does it make? We're technology, anytime, anywhere, any place, from any device. So eat your own dog food here. Let them work the way they want to work, as long as they're getting the job done. Um, they like having choice. Lack of control really bogs them down. Dress code. That's one that you wouldn't think, because most of us in IT, we don't really have dress codes. But if you tell somebody what they can and cannot wear, uh, particularly younger people, that's just, they don't want, they don't want that, that tightness, they don't want that culture of the man is in control. And then they're going to say, what difference does it make what I wear? But it does make a difference. Culture of choice. Choose your battles, okay? I mean, there's sometimes when you have to, as a manager, you have to fight a battle and you have to put a stake in the ground. But there's a lot of times that, well, because that's the way we do it. That's the way we've, we've always, everybody uses this. So be flexible. No reason not to. Culture of balance. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here because I think Shannon and Maurice are doing a session or having <coughs> earlier today on work-life balance. But, you know, there's your <coughs> flex time, your comp time, your work from home. There's another one that's kind of interesting, mobility tools. Um, anybody here support Oracle in your shops? Oracle now has a mobile device, a mobile app that you can run on your smartphone where you can actually monitor your database performances. You can start and restock services right there from your phone <coughs> if you, once you've set it up and configured it. So if my DBA who works four, four days a week, ten hours a day, so he's got Fridays off, but he's on call. He knows that and of course weekends as well. But if I have an issue, he's always got a smartphone with him. And if he can, you know, pop on that smartphone and make that repair or restart that service or give me an answer without having to stop what he's doing and come back into the office, that's huge. And I mean, I say that because that, that's a neat tool, but think about other tools, you know? How can you invest in tools that can make your workforce and allow your workforce to have more of that balance. I mean, yeah, we've all got opportunities. Everybody remotes in. Everybody can remote in from home. <clears throat> but what if you're not home? What if you aren't next to um, your computer? You know, how are you going to do that? Then I've got to stop what I'm doing. I'm at the kids' soccer game. I'm here. I can't go on vacation because somebody's got to be able to do this. Well, no, you can't go, but what if we have, we're upgrading something, so what if, we, what if we have to call you? So the more we can put mobility and tools in their hands, again, the more we can cut down on the stress and add to that culture of balance that's so important to everybody. Development. You want to work in an environment where people feel like there's a career path for them, that they're not just here doing a job. And if they don't see that progression, um, they're probably not going to stay too long. They're going to stay long enough to beef up their skills and get their certifications, and then they're going to the, hit the job boards and Twitter and everywhere else and look for somewhere else to go. So offer them training and, and career paths. And it starts at the, at the supervisor level. Have conversations with your staff. Do you know what the career goals are for all your direct reports? Do you really? 
I can tell you what the career goals are for my team because I ask them. You know, you have this position and you know, you're doing really good in this analyst position or in this senior position or in this project leader position. Is this where you're happy? Is this, you know, do you want to keep growing skills and become the master in this or do you have aspirations for other things? Because um, they don't always tell you. A lot of people are afraid to bring that up. Um, for whatever reason, they're, they're shy about it. So it's important to know where your folks really see themselves and where they want to take their careers. So have those conversations. And, ask, and when you know that, whether they want to be the best project manager they can be, or whether they see project management as just a step to the next level, then you can start developing individual plans um, for your evaluation process. Or as part of that, okay, let's set some goals for you. If this is what you want to do, let's set some goals for next year. Let me see if we can find some training so you can um, become certified in, in this particular thing. And try as best you can to budget sufficient funding. Even if you can't give everybody the four days of training somewhere that they want to go, if they know you're interested in helping them and you're a partner with them in that career development, they will stick with you because they know it's coming. Okay, maybe I don't get to go to the conference in California um, this year, but if I'm going to, if you tell me you're going to try and get me to go next year, then okay, I understand that. And they'll buy into it. Culture of care. Inspiration versus induction. This goes back to the whole thing about telling people what they have to do and how they have to do it. Um, Everybody likes to feel like their opinions count. So you want to inspire people to look for creative ways to solve problems. You don't want to just tell them, this is how we do it. And no, you can't do that. Or, but, but what about, no. That's when you get back to that culture of dictatorship that shows up on the website that you know, it doesn't speak well for your department. Um, everybody wants to feel like they're contributing to the greater good. Everybody should have a voice. Um, work in teams. Try and build team collaboration where there's a group ownership of something. You know, I don't succeed as a manager unless the people on my team succeed. And everybody can't be an expert at everything. So the more I can engage and bring in different perspectives to any conversation or any application we're trying to build or any problem we're trying to solve, security or um, how you're going to deliver something to an employee or you know, maybe somebody's having, we keep having issues with people printing and printers dropping off on Whatever it is, the more you can bring to it, the more you can, more different ways you can solve the problem. You can throw things out there. Hey, what if we did this? Well, then you may know something and want to throw something out. Yeah, that'll work, but what, have you considered this? Oh, well, no. The more you thrash the stuff out, the more you come to the best plan to try and go after whatever it is that you're putting together. And people have some ownership in that, and they feel like they're, they're valued. And you have to say, you know, it's okay if somebody says something. They're not knocking down your, your proposal. They're helping us all to build a better product. And that's something that you have to cultivate. Again, it's, it's culture. You have to make that happen and see that it doesn't get into finger pointing. Well, she always shoots me down. No. <coughs> you want that person there to bring that perspective because if we don't take into account what she says, we're likely to fail. She's been there. She's worn those shoes. And then there's always things that you can do um, like 360 evaluations and consulting engagements and that sort of thing. But if you do have issues in your um, department, you want to try and deal with those before your employees leave, particularly the good ones. And you don't want them to get so disheartened that they just don't care and they become nine to eight to fivers, where they used to be really inspired individuals. So you have to look after them and continue to look after them if you want them to stay and be those productive employees. So, succession planning. Here's the other part. I'm in this group right here. 
Um, this is the workforce in IT. This is from the U.S. labor force statistics. Median IT age is 40.7 years old. People are dropping off. They're retiring. These folks are coming in. They're here. They should be, they should be moving in this direction. That's where we want them to go. We want to grow this. But are they all ready? Succession planning. You're preparing that next generation of technology professionals. Those first two groups that, that you saw there. You're preparing them to take over as these other folks do. <coughs> and a lot of your best technical employees <coughs> lack the soft skills. They can't sit in that department head meeting. Um, they don't, going back to dress, again, you're not want to be careful about that, but um, you don't show up at a city manager's department meeting wearing a polo shirt and a pair of flip-flops. <coughs> Maybe it's okay to wear that in the IT department, but not there. Um, you don't go to, you don't suddenly take over um, a budget that's, you know, anywhere from one to four or five million dollars for an IT budget and not know anything about frock codes and chargebacks and things like that. Um, so at some point, if these folks are going to move up in this direction, and if you've been speaking to them and you know that those are their goals, that some of these folks do want to eventually become IT directors and managers, then you've got to help groom them to take over. Because if you don't, they're going to sit in an interview where maybe there is somebody from the outside sitting in, and they're going to go, this guy's a techie. But there's no way he can run this department. And you just screwed over a great employee. But they're not ready to do this job because they've spent too much time in the technical ways. So they've got to be exposed. How can you help them? Well, first of all, there's simple things. Make sure they get a chance to build their own networks. If that means because you don't have enough money to send everybody that you take a year off. I took two years off from coming to the spring conference just so I could send some of my other people. I mean, I've got contacts. I know who to call. But they need to be exposed to that. They need to meet their peers. So try and give them opportunities in groups like Nickel Jesus. There's the CGCIO program. I was in the very first one back in 2005, and I'm amazed to this day that it continued. Um, I thought we were broken Shannon for sure. <laughs> but, Again, going back, if you know that you know, I want to be an IT director, I really want to grow in this organization, then you can identify those candidates and start to budget for it and help preparing them, help to prepare them to be able to attend programs like that. And that's an incredibly cost-effective program. <coughs> the School of Government also has programs like the um, Municipal Government one that they do, the, the Administrator one, uh, there's the Pella program. There's a lot of stuff there, again, to build um, public sector leadership. Um, encourage your HR department to begin a succession training program. Um, and again, this where the programs at the School of Government talk about things in general, an internal succession program can teach things about your organization, how you're organized, how you do your purchasing. It introduces them to other city leaders who might be doing the presentation. Um, Trust me, the network guy doesn't really care about bullying in the workplace. They don't really care about safety compliance. They don't really care about how you can um, spot drug abuse because that's not their world. But if they're going to move up, they're going to have to understand that stuff. So a succession planning program can give them exposure to some of these higher level things beyond the technology. And then you can start a formal or an informal mentoring program within your department. Maybe your HR department's not ready to do something, but you can start partnering people to do some mentoring. And, you know, be careful about that. I mean, add, some, add something, make it as real as you can make it. Um, okay, I'm going to let you partner with this particular person, and the, the idea here is that you learn how to do such and such a thing. So put, put some goals in it so that they have a stake as well. And then also give them the time to do it. You know, don't, don't just say, yeah, you go, you go work with Nancy and uh, spend some time with her, but then keep pulling them away. 
Every time Nancy has a plan, okay, we're going to talk about budget. I'm going to teach you how I do chargebacks for all the applications we support because, you know, there's a, there's a component where we've got the hours that we support. And there's the dollars involved with the licensing. And here's how we break it up. Um, don't say you're going to do that and then pull them away. So do it right. And once again, questions or ideas? Was any of this helpful? Good. Because <laughs> I, did, I did spend quite a bit of time trying to track it down. And I'll be honest, we don't follow all of those, but I'm trying to get us there. Yes? Just wanted to get your thoughts about um, <coughs> how you uh, attract and retain young local talent. And what I'm talking about is, if you're in the Triangle, Triad, or Charlotte, it may not be as big a deal, but if you're in the more rural parts of the state, or even somewhere like Bayville, where I'm at, a lot of times we'll see our young people graduate high school, they'll go off to college, and then they're not interested in coming back. And I think it's, it's a little bit of a brain drain for some of those areas of the state. I don't know if you had any thoughts or ideas about what to do maybe to retain some of that talent in the local area. Um. I actually recently attended um, a job fair at our local community college, and it was IT based um, because I worked with the um, head of that particular department. And so it was a small group of folks there, but I actually talked to the students. And we're going to be setting up um, some open house events for them to come in and, and see what we do, and potentially doing some. Q&A type things where, hey, you know, you're a, a recent uh, graduate or you're about to graduate from this. Maybe I can't hire you today, but let me tell you how cool it is to work here. And let me give you a chance to talk to some of our folks. And you ask the experts, so to speak, well, what's a day like? And you're a network administrator. What do you do all day? Um, and then it gives them a chance to kind of see, am I interested in this? Or what other skills do I need to beef up? And it can also open up some internship type things, you know, where they can come. Now, are you going to be able to hire somebody right out of um, community college to do some of these jobs? Probably not. But again, you're making those contacts, and they're those people living on social media. So they, even if you don't have something for them right away, they can help to, to build that brand. Um, that's what, what we've tried to do, and there's, I've done it with the community college, and then I want to expand it this next fiscal year. Uh, we have Wake Forest and Winston-Salem State that are both near us, and they both have programs. And so again, we want to try and, and reach out and start getting them before they leave. Um, I'll chime in. I'm a little bit biased because I do work in community college, but the community college students, the stats are showing that somewhere between 60 and 70 percent stay in the area where they graduate, because if you go out and talk to the university students, I'm in Greenville, um, ECU, it's about 70% of the students leave the area. So that's what we do, is we start talking, we start talking to our students early, but the thing that we do is we make that connection. Yeah. That way once they do have some of the skills that I'm looking for, I can see them. And I've also offered to these students, I handed out my business card, look, if you want to like I've got all this time, but I still, I mean, you have to make time for this. This is important because these are people that, are, that I'm going to be entrusting things to when I leave, you know. So we got to get people in there. But, you know, I've said, look, if you want to talk about IT and IT careers, call me. If I can't, if it's not my area, I'll try and find some time and someone to actually talk to you. Show that you care about them. There was another... I was just going to make a suggestion that uh, if you do know young folks that are in college their senior year or finishing, just finishing in community college, we brought uh, my niece to GIS in her senior year um, in college to Nickel Jesus two or three Ooh. times. Yeah. And she met people and did a lot of networking and she went to the sessions to learn what's real life about. <laughs> different than just being in college. And it was just a wonderful experience for her. I bet it was. That's a cool idea. Maybe bring them in as a guest or something? Yep, we did. Nice. Anything else? 
Well, presentation is supposed to be online at some point, and um, I've been videoed, and I don't even want to think about that. Um, <laughs> how goofy I look on, on camera, but whatever. Um, can't be any goofier than the pictures my daughter posts of me on social media. Um, so if you have any questions afterwards or you want to reach out to me um, and would like to see some of any of the sources that that I hit, you know, in preparing this, I'll be glad to share because I think this is an area where you know, we all have, have a vested interest. Thanks for coming.